For centuries, the records and images of human endeavor have been preserved in books. Bookmaking was once a craft, and like many crafts of the past, combined fine workmanship and durable materials. This book is 500 years old. The paper is still flexible, and the binding is strong. The advent of the printing press stimulated a significant growth in the reading public and created the need for plentiful cheap paper. Since that time, increasingly rapid production methods have altered all aspects of bookmaking and turned a craft into an industry. As a result, both the permanence and durability of the book have declined. During the 19th century, Paper makers began to use fibers and additives which introduced acid into their final product. It is the acid in paper which causes it to darken and become brittle. The book in the foreground was published in 1949. The one behind it, a 1969 imprint, will look much the same in 20 years. The Industrial Revolution spurred a dramatic decline in the strength of book bindings. The volume to the right was bound in the 15th century. Its pages are sewn onto three thongs, which are then laced through channels in the wooden boards. Its modern counterpart relies on glue and a flimsy cloth strip to attach the text block to its cover. Most new books are made this way and break down after several readings, as this one has. Poorly made books harbor a host of demons for the librarian trying to encourage the circulation of materials and preserve them for future generations. The disturbing truth is that we are currently storing information on a highly unstable medium. However, there are ways we can slow down deterioration. Environmental control is our single most important means of preserving library collections. Think of a greenhouse, a warm, bright, moist place, great for plants, but devastating for books. Heat, light, and moisture speed up the chemical activity and biological attack which cause paper, leather, and glue to decompose. Unfortunately, the book that lives in absolute darkness and very cold temperatures lives the longest. Accommodating it entirely would be less than ideal for readers. But we can reach a compromise between the storage requirements of books and the needs of people. We can try to control temperature and humidity at the established guidelines of 68 degrees Fahrenheit and 50% relative humidity. We can turn unnecessary lights off, sunny windows can be curtained, and fluorescent lights filtered. We can keep our building and collections cleaner by establishing more thorough housekeeping routines. Long-range planning and adequate funding are vital. But we can do more than look to the future for solutions to immediate problems. The power to preserve is in our hands. Most materials arrive at our doors via the mail. Whether they are intact or in pieces is partly a function of the way they have been packaged. This reinforced box is fitted with Velcro straps which adjust to provide firm support. It is sturdy, reusable, and an excellent means of transferring interlibrary loans. Packaging need not be expensive to be good, however. Standard materials can be combined to create sturdy wrappers. Because padded mailing bags are very flexible, the brittle pamphlet to the left has been sandwiched between two pieces of cardboard so that it will not break. The book to the right needs more protection than a cardboard box provides if it is to survive bad weather and rough handling. It has been wrapped in glassine paper and plastic cushioning material before boxing. Once in the library, New acquisitions begin their perilous journey through the processing area. Shelving at workstations is often dictated by circumstances rather than by concern for preservation. 
The pressures that shortages of staff and space exert on people are often transferred to the books they handle. Materials are stuffed wherever they will fit. After all, they'll be out of the department before long. But how long is long? Obviously too long for this book. Every staff member must be concerned with books as physical objects if the information they contain is to remain accessible. We are all custodians, regardless of our other library responsibilities. When cataloging has begun, it is not unusual for cards and papers to travel with a book as it is being processed. The volume on the right is obviously strained by the bulky pack of cards which has been jammed inside its front cover tightly against the hinge. A binding is tailor-made to suit the thickness of its text block and inserts can ruin it. Even a thin packet like the one on the left should be placed in the center of the text block and away from the inner margin. Paper clips are handy and always a reach away, but the pages of books often bear their scars, rust stains, crimps, and tears. Does the convenience of temporary attachment justify permanent damage? Processing slips tucked into the center of a text block will stay there if a book is handled carefully. Rubber bands are another common enemy of books. Only part of the damage being done here is visible. As rubber rots, it becomes sticky and emits damaging sulfur compounds. Cotton tape is a good alternative. It is soft, stable, and useful for tying up books which need repair. Unfortunately, inappropriate use of any product can be damaging. These sheets should have been placed securely in the center of the book and sent directly to the person who will trim and attach them. Well-meant repairs made on materials which don't seem of special importance at the time may be keenly regretted later. It can take hours to remove the residue from a few pieces of old tape. There is an acid-free, pressure-sensitive tape on the market which is as easy to use as the household variety and does not stain. But use it with caution. Tape is never acceptable for mending rare and valuable items. If there is a staff member or unit in the library experienced in making repairs, don't complicate their efforts by trying to save them work. There is no good reason for making unnecessary permanent marks on library materials. These special instructions could easily have been jotted on a scrap of paper. The person who will attach this errata sheet has been given little incentive to do a neat job. Most materials must be marked to identify them as library property. Placement of identification and special instructions should be well thought out so that defacement is minimized. Every routine procedure is important. Sloppy application of stamps and pockets lays the groundwork for continued careless handling. Too much ink on a stamp pad has ruined this title page. Where should the date due slip be attached? Not inside the front or rear cover. The force of stamping bends the board and strains the weakest part of the binding the hinge where cover and text block meet. This circulation desk attendant is doing a good job of coping with a built-in problem. Because the book cover rests on a desk surface, less strain is exerted on its hinge. The charge slip attached to the book on the left is well placed. The text block can better tolerate repeated stamping. When materials are ready for the shelf, use a truck to move them there. How often do we discover, halfway through a precarious trip, that those few extra books, grabbed as an afterthought, were a few too many? Correct use of trucks is an easily learned skill. Examine the next one you see. Are materials leaning or unsupported? Are they shelved on their fore edges? If you can see books which are misshapened, 
a shelving problem exists. Although appearance itself is of little consequence, a well-loaded truck looks tidy. Books have right angles, so should rest on flat planes. Here, large books have been placed on the top shelf so that they don't crush the heads of others and are in little danger of sliding off. Books on the second shelf are well supported by the sides of the truck. Their spines are parallel to each other and perpendicular to the shelf bottom. The bottom shelf is only partially full, so a pile of books has been laid flat to support the others. Rough, uneven floors present special problems. Here, two bicycle inner tubes have been stretched around a truck to provide soft, flexible support. Elevators are a mixed blessing in buildings with more than one floor. An improperly loaded or overloaded truck can be very difficult to maneuver into a narrow closet, especially one with a perpetually closing door. Some elevators have emergency stop buttons, which greatly assist a safe entry. Our only other recourse is to be alert and gymnastic. It is not unusual for elevators to stop out of alignment with the floor. This truck will have to be lifted over a one-inch step, a good case for being careful not to overload it. Two safe trips can take less time than one disaster. Materials which survive processing and transport are not necessarily out of danger. Once shelved, they may remain undisturbed for a long time. When will this group be rescued? The tops of books should never double as extra shelf space. The very small volume is likely to be squeezed back behind the others, where it will be lost to the patron indefinitely. Shelves this tightly packed signal the need for minor or major rearranging. This abrasion could have been prevented by allowing both books the shelf room they needed and putting a barrier of acid-free cardboard between them. An even better way to ensure that books with metal fastenings can't damage their neighbors is to place them in acid-free boxes. Unbound materials are particularly vulnerable to light, dust, and mechanical damage. Acid-free boxes provide a simple, relatively inexpensive means of protecting them. Those shown here have steel-reinforced edges for greater strength and durability. When books are shelved too loosely, they lean and splay to compensate for the extra space. Several of these volumes are now distorted. Every day they remain this way, the damage becomes more severe. Eventually, it will be irreversible. Bookends, if properly used, can provide just the right amount of support. Like books, some are a great deal better than others. They should be free of sharp or rusty edges, support over half the height of the book, and have a wide profile. Those that aren't sufficiently thick or tall can be adapted. The orange one to the far right was made by gluing cardboard to a short bookend, then covering it with buckram. The hazard of bookends with a narrow profile is that they can be easily overlooked and mutilate books which are accidentally forced against them. This volume is just another statistic a victim of anonymous knifing. Books need both horizontal and vertical room. This book is simply too tall for the shelf height. Trying to make it fit will only damage it. Four-edge shelving is definitely not the way to make space for tall books. A text block left dangling in midair pulls itself out of its case. Books with weak bindings and heavy text blocks succumb first, but gravity always wins. 
When space is limited, tall volumes can be shelved spine down, like the two shown here. Because this hides the label, it is best to write the call number on a strip of acid-free paper and place it in the center of the text block. This extra effort not only makes it easier to find the book, but also less likely that people will handle it unnecessarily when looking for another. A better solution is to provide special shelving for oversized and folio volumes. When small books are forced to support tall ones, both usually suffer. The vellum-bound book to the far left has so much freedom to expand that it has actually pulled itself apart. The ideal solution is to shelve books by size. In libraries where compact shelving is practical, space and books are saved. Volumes of like size provide perfect support for each other. Taking a book off the shelf as carefully as you have put it on requires know-how. Push the volume on either side back slightly and grasp it mid-spine. If every reader removes this book correctly, its head cap will never look like the others on the shelf. When shelving is tight, a book can be removed by placing an index finger firmly on the head of the text block and tipping it out. Retrieving it this way is just as easy as yanking it by the head cap, and the binding is spared mutilation. Unbound materials such as maps and broadsides are especially awkward to retrieve and tear easily. They are often oversized and stored in piles. If your selection happens to be on the bottom of the stack, resist the temptation to drag it out. Uncover it by lifting off the upper items. Folios are also awkward to retrieve. Because their bindings are rarely strong enough to support their weight, big books are quite delicate. Ideally, they are stored flat, one to a shelf. But stacking is not uncommon in overcrowded buildings. When this is the case, remove volumes one by one. An obstacle course of jutting folios can be averted if shelves are wide enough. If books must be shelved in high places, provide stools to help people reach them and use one yourself. Save a book from a six-foot drop. Our responsibility to maintain access is fulfilled when a book reaches a reader's hands. But who wants so permanent a record of success? Fingerprints are often impossible to remove. All library materials deserve thoughtful treatment Clean hands are a good beginning. This book is being subwayed. That is, read in that one-handed fashion which commuters have made famous. Even a used paperback deserves better treatment. A properly bound book will open flat and stay open, but most volumes don't cooperate this way and require the support of two hands. Instead, this person has used another book as a prop. The stains made by its rotting binding are an obvious sign of ruin. Less visible, and perhaps more damaging, is the stress which the weight of the closed book exerts on the open one. No bookmark. Better to lose your place than to risk dirty pages and weakened bindings. Any place marker, however handy, which prevents a book from closing comfortably, strains it. Even paper markers can be destructive if an excessive number of them are stuffed between the leaves of a text block. Imagine what would happen if a heavy volume were placed on top of this one. Turning down page corners is an easy way to mark one's place, 
but creases don't disappear, and corners sometimes do. Brittle paper breaks with one fold. Enclosures can produce surprisingly destructive results. Here, acid from a place mark has migrated into the book paper and permanently stained it. Sometimes newspaper clippings complement a text, but any interesting auxiliary materials should be kept in a separate file or copied onto acid-free paper. These markings have no place in a library book. Everyone should have the privilege of reading an unspoiled text. Although film is a relatively new medium for storing information, it is likely to make up an increasingly large percentage of most library collections. Because it must be stored, handled, and even read differently than print on paper, we need to educate ourselves and others to treat it with care. Rolls of film should be wound on plastic reels, secured with acid-free strips, and stored in their own acid-free boxes. All film should be handled by the edges. Fingerprints and scratches obliterate photographic images. Damage which may appear insignificant to the naked eye is drastic when the microtext is enlarged for reading. This person may be losing a few frames of valuable information. When film breaks during use, which is not uncommon, it should be heat welded or repaired with a cement manufactured specifically for that purpose. Pressure sensitive tapes are not satisfactory. To help patrons learn ground rules for proper handling, post clear instructions on microfilm readers. Photocopy machines are another modern innovation which present us with unique challenges. The models we find in libraries are not designed to copy facing pages in bound volumes. This attempt to mash pages flat will surely damage the book and may even shatter the glass surface. Acidic paper further complicates efforts to photocopy books without damaging them. Once pages are embrittled, they respond to pressure by crumbling. Even light pressure, carefully applied, is no safeguard against damage if the book is placed on the screen hastily. Pages accidentally crumpled will crease or break. It is not surprising that people sometimes have to struggle to obtain acceptable reproductions of a text. These days, book manufacturers are often stingy with the all-important inner margin, and rebinding can eliminate it entirely. In cases like this, it is often necessary to settle for less than perfect copy. Write to the publishers. Let them know that you are concerned about narrow margins and acidic paper. This book was not flexible enough to withstand being opened 180 degrees. It yielded by cracking in half. Some of these problems can be alleviated by installing machines on which books can be copied when opened only 90 degrees. Because the glass panel is flush with the edge of the machine, it fits squarely against the inner margin of the volume. If the overhanging text is firmly supported, the binding is subjected to less strain. Illustrated signs can be posted instructing patrons to use this preservation technique. When people have finished at the copy machine, they need a place to put the volumes with which they have been working. Providing book trucks for that purpose is an easy way to rescue materials from dirty floors. There are many ways that good book handling habits can be passed on from the library staff to the patron. Signs, pamphlets, and displays are valuable tools for reader education. 
On rainy days, providing plastic bags to protect circulating materials is a way of saying, this book is important. Take good care of it. The more people know about how to care for books, the less likely they are to damage them accidentally. Though the light and heat in the library may be intentionally minimized, heavily circulated materials are rarely stored there. Borrowers who know the causes of paper deterioration are less likely to leave books on radiators in sunny windows. Unlike the morning newspaper, library materials cannot be tossed in the waste basket after casual reading. Distracting coffee rings and grease stains are attractive only to hungry insects and become a permanent record of thoughtlessness. Borrowers need to know that the library's ban on food and beverages is based on more than a desire to keep the building clean. Devising ways to remind people that some materials are irreplaceable is good preventative medicine. Cautious readers store borrowed books in safe places. The dog that made a meal of these choice volumes didn't realize that the small one is the only known copy in the United States. Library materials which survive being brought home face yet another trauma. Return at the book drop. This sorry heap tells the story. Book drops have only convenience to recommend them and if possible should be locked during the hours when the library is open. Signs can be posted asking patrons to use them only for emergency returns. During periods of heavy circulation, the schedule for emptying them should be stepped up. Benign neglect results in loss of information. Little abuses do accumulate and could snowball into big problems. Much of our written culture is threatened with extinction. There are those who say that the day will come when all information is stored on computers. But who will preserve the printed page until it is transformed to electronic impulse? And who will convince this fellow that the pleasures of the machine equal those of the book?